So I kind of uh, made this, try to make this a little bit innovative and also probably a little bit provocative. I think the idea is not to, uh, the idea is to imagine the power sector uh, in 2040. Everybody talks 2030 as the magic number and uh, I, I didn't want that magic number to be there but I wanted 2040 where I want the imagination to go wild. Um, but uh, but the key thing about this uh, panel discussion is the future of consumer engagement in the electricity sector. That's I think the key part of it because this conference kind of focuses on consumer engagement uh, in this. Uh, and uh, I had set a, given a set of guiding questions to the panelists and uh, to make them do their homework. But uh, yeah, and the part one of the uh, of the question that I asked them was, how do you see the power of electricity sector evolving, taking a future timeline of 2040? Do you think it will be centralized, semi-hierarchical, modular, and decentralized? What do you think will be the role of the state in 2040? Part two, I asked them. The another guiding question was, what are the opportunities and challenges that you feel the power sector will face in say 2040? Part 3 is where or how do you see consumers being placed in the sector in 2040? Part 4 is how do you see them being engaged? Do you think they will have more information than they can possibly imagine? Giving them more power over the utility or will consumers get a raw deal? <coughs> and finally the part where consumers, do you think LC consumers may face any issues or no issues at all, only household issues? as they can have. Uh, the is not such an important topic anymore. Uh, so I think uh, that that was the way in which I gave those daily questions. Uh, more important, what I thought would be good is to have the specializations first. Uh, Mr. Vishnu Mohan Kumar has, will be like uh, talking on, from ITDP will be talking on electric mobility. Abhishek Jain will talk about uh, I don't know, his energy efficiency, conservation or probably the role of IOTs or uh, whatever he feels is the way forward. Uh, I've got uh, Ms. Richa Prasa who will talk about uh, policies and uh, how probably the sector will kind of uh, evolve itself, more the building blocks of the sector, how it kind of uh, then I'll ask Mr. Vaughan to talk about renewable energy. Renewable energy or anything that he feels is more important, we need to take into consideration in 2040. Then I, once the technology and the general speak, I think uh, we need to place this within a legal and regulatory or in a competition framework. I think uh, one phrase which I often think about is uh, when uh, when competition sets in in the sector, regulation will fade away. Is something that I Stephen Little Child used to keep keeps talking about. So regulator is just uh, uh, holding the fort for competition to come in. So that's, uh, that's what I feel like. Then I thought, then in these two cases, then Mr. Raja will speak. Uh, then Mr. Geeta. So I think the first part spent is Mr. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank uh, CZ for inviting me uh, to this event. So what are we doing here in, uh, in a workshop which is focused on electricity and power? Uh, so this is a question that uh, has become more and more uh, you know, commonplace as uh, electric mobility gains uh, more and more traction all across the world. Uh, so there has been a lot of capacity building for all of us. Uh, suddenly we see a lot of discoms coming up and starting uh, to talk about buses. Uh, you have the Department of Heavy Industries, which is not particularly related to our work, otherwise suddenly becoming one of the leading uh, financiers of buses in the country. Uh, we have uh, people like me who used to talk about mode shares, about vehicle types, suddenly uh, looking at our uh, 10 standard physics, trying to figure out the relation between current uh, voltage and uh, so on. So there's a lot of churn happening here and uh, I am probably much uh, less qualified to speak here than a lot of you here. But still, uh, we believe that there are very important uh, 
roles that uh, these two uh, that electric mobility is going to play in the future and I just want to give you an overview of that. Uh, so firstly, why is electric mobility uh, coming into the picture all of a sudden? Uh, and is it all of a sudden? Uh, so the answer to that first question is no. Uh, electric mobility was actually uh, is as old as your uh, as your first automobile. It's just that it sort of lost out its way. But currently, uh, electric mobility is coming back in a big way. And that is because of uh, all of us realizing that climate change is something absolutely real. And the current paths of consumption and development that uh, we have taken is not going to uh, be sustainable. Uh, we, are, uh, we are reaching a cliff edge and it looks like we're going to jump down. Uh, and therefore, we are trying to look at all possible solutions which might pull us back from the cliff edge. Uh, and that is one major reason why electric mobility has suddenly caught on globally. Uh, so a bit of a background, uh, transportation uh, in terms of carbon emissions worldwide accounts for nearly one fourth of the total uh, um, global emissions. One in uh, every four uh, kilograms of CO2 emitted in the atmosphere comes from transport. Uh, so it is split between different groups, uh, between urban transport and between uh, rural, between uh, freight transport and passenger transport, between uh, shipping and aviation and so on. So the biggest culprits is, are usually uh, shipping, uh, your rural transport and the kind of uh, development patterns that you see in our cities today, which say that, you know, everyone wants to have a car, everyone should have a car. That's how people move about. So what we at ITDP do is try to sort of uh, make people and governments, uh, you know, say that, you know, that is not actually the way forward. Uh, so essentially, the paradigm that we see in our cities says that, you know, we want everyone to, everyone wants to have a car or at least a two wheeler because, you know, who goes in buses? You see how many people go in MTC buses, no? There are 1200 people going in every MTC bus per day, 1200 people. Now for comparison, uh, if you look at most other cities, that number is around 600. So that means there are twice as many people using our buses, uh, uh, using buses in Chennai as compared to most other cities. Now this is not because, you know, uh, MTC buses are the best in the country. This is because MTC has some of the uh, cheaper fares, uh, cheapest fares in the country and therefore people can actually afford to use buses. In most other cities in the country, what we see is that either there is no buses or if you say look at a city like Bangalore or Bombay, buses are so expensive that most people cannot afford to take it. And, uh, and therefore, what do people do? People end up walking. Some people who can uh, afford that end up uh, afford cycles, uh, cycle to work or rent a cycle and so on. Uh, and there are lots of uh, different uh, differentiations here. So women tend, uh, tend to work, walk more, uh, men tend to use uh, two wheelers more and so on. Uh, the elderly tend not to travel as much because you do not, you cannot travel uh, as much. So overall, the paradigm that you see in our cities is of private motor vehicle oriented growth. So our governments also say that, you know, the, we have a flyover right outside. We will make one more flyover if there is uh, more vehicular congestion. So uh, essentially, we've always said that we need more and more vehicles we, uh, and we need more and more road space to ensure that these vehicles move forward. Uh, while uh, governments do not acknowledge that most people in our cities are uh, cannot afford to uh, take, do not have public transport or cannot afford to do that. So that is one paradigm within which our cities operate. Uh, a large number of those who have uh, two wheelers or cars in our cities are uh, have their own sets of issues. They have uh, rising fuel prices to contend with. They have limited road space. Congestion is a huge issue in all of our cities and thousands of crores of rupees are being wasted on such uh, issue, uh, on congestion, on lost productivity and man manners. 
so while this is the case of Indian cities, globally also there have been some, uh, some of the same things happening. Uh, and most importantly, uh, the old paradigm of uh, motor vehicles, uh, you know, internal com combustion engine uh, vehicles co uh, contributed to a fourth of your transport emissions. So electric mobility sort of came in as a place where they said that, you know, your carbon emissions are rising and we need to absolutely curtail that. And we need to switch to, elect, uh, to uh, lesser emitting modes of, uh, uh, of mobility. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> so that's how electric vehicles sort of gain traction. So they have been, uh, they have exponentially grown over this decade. So, uh, for instance, at the start of this decade, there were less than uh, fifty to hundred thousand electric vehicles all over the globe, and uh, most recent estimates suggest that there are now seven million electric vehicles in the world. So. 7 million vehicles seems like a big number, but uh, it is not that high. Uh, and this is spread out uh, mostly in the US, in China, and in parts of Europe. Uh, India is also growing, and I'll come a bit uh, to that later. Uh, sorry, I lost a bit of my train of thought. Uh, yeah, so electric mobility. Uh, as I said, India is also sort of pushing for it. Uh, so there are se several schemes that you would have he heard of, FAME 1 and FAME 2 being the most prominent uh, one of them, saying faster, uh, which is the faster adoption and manufacture of electric vehicles. Uh, so I'll just uh, take you briefly through that to sort of uh, show you what the intentions of the government were in the two rounds of the scheme and how that reflects the broader uh, broader perspective that electric mobility is having. So in the first round of FAME scheme, which came out in 2015, the government essentially decided to spend some money and uh, say, uh, spend some money subsidizing electric vehicles. So this was 2014-15 when electric vehicles were still new. You don't see much in uh, much electric vehicles on our road. Uh, so, you know, it, it didn't take off as much as the government hoped it would. Uh, and that was understandable also because the uh, sector itself was not as mature as it is today. Uh, a lot of vehicles at that point in time were hybrids. So you would have uh, heard about the Toyota Prius, Prius, I still don't know how to pronounce that. The Prius, which was the most popular vehicle in places like California for a while because they were hybrid vehicles, meaning that they could run both with a battery as well as use your conventional uh, inter internal combustion engine. Uh, so these were seen as the uh, most avant-garde of uh, uh, vehicles at that point. Uh, they were said to be en environmentally friendly and so on and uh, companies like Toyota were hugely pushing for these. Uh, but of course, these things, uh, these vehicles were quite expensive and that's because at that point, batteries, uh, your lithium ion batteries, the ones that we see in our, in our phones uh, and our laptops, these were much, much more expensive at that point. So, <clears throat> uh, this sector has been uh, maturing closely over the past five years. Uh, in India, uh, what happened was that the government uh, assuming that hybrids were the way forward, uh, gave a lot of money, uh, financial subsidies to uh, people, to consumers who were buying uh, hybrid vehicles. There was also subsidies, uh, financial incentives given to uh, two-wheelers, uh, which were sort of getting prevalent in India at that point, uh, <clears throat> as well as three-wheelers and buses. So initially, no one really knew about this scheme. There was a lot of confusion between governments uh, uh, between different government departments and programs at that point because, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, in India, uh, a lot of our programs have a, 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 a period before it sort of scales up and this was unfortunately that period or maybe fortunately. So what happened was that over the five years of FAME 1, nothing much happened. A lot of two-wheelers, hybrid uh, cars, a, a lot of hybrid cars, not two wheelers, got financial incentives and that's where most of the money was spent by the government. So 
at that point a lot uh, at uh, at the end of the uh, program of fame one uh, the government as well as a lot of organizations looked at what was happening uh, is this really the way that you want to push electric mobility forward what are other countries uh, and cities across the world doing uh, <clears throat> essentially they said that you know uh, uh, if the future of mobility is going to be threefold and i'm using the words of uh, niti aayog here uh, i feel that there are three good objectives to have uh, but we really need to uh, prioritize uh, we really need to ensure which of the areas we uh, prioritize so niti aayog said that the future of mobility in india is going to be one shared two connected three electric so let me talk a bit more about shared mobility uh, a lot of you might have heard of ola and uber being described as shared mobility we at itdp also believe that public transport uh, and your share autos these are all part of shared mobility so in that way we completely uh, sort of endorse niti aayog's uh, position that the future of mobility is going to be shared so what this means for consumers and citizens especially those who have private motor vehicles is that this might not be what we see in the future in 2040 this is probably not going to be a sustainable way people might not be able to take out their private vehicles whether it be a four wheeler or a two wheeler out into the city any time uh, in the way that they do currently we have to change and why is shared so important uh the answer is that uh, one in india as you all know electricity generation is primarily coal driven uh, what uh, nearly 67 to 70 percentage is coal driven so if we look at the kind of uh, vehicles that we have and the kind of batteries and the kind of charging infrastructure that we have for electric mobility in our cities uh if we just transition from our current cars or two wheelers to electric cars or two wheelers it is not going to be sufficient to reduce carbon emissions in fact uh, analysis that i have done personally and which uh, a couple of other people have also been doing similar kind of work it shows that uh, currently using a electric uh, vehicle will actually release more carbon emissions into the atmosphere than using a petrol car so petrol is apparently still more environmental uh, friendly than your electric vehicle so then how can you ensure that you can reduce emissions and this is something that uh, and reducing emissions is something that none of us are going to argue over i hope because it is absolutely essential for our survival as a species so uh any sort of modeling exercise that we undertook showed that over the next 10 20 or 30 years what's going to happen is that people's demand to move uh the consumers demand to move uh, mobility will only increase uh the international transport forum estimates that the total demand for mobility will triple by 2050 and uh, that means that you know currently we are emitting x amount of uh, greenhouse gases from uh, transport it's going to be 3x and we are not going to reach any targets that we have been setting for ourselves uh, and the only way we can reduce that is to ensure that vehicles are shared that people move away from private motor vehicles and towards public transport towards active modes of transport which include cycling walking uh, you have uh, yulu and bounce and all these e scooters which are there that also seems like a good option but people have to ditch their cars and two wheelers behind people have to move towards buses they have to move towards shared autos there is no other way forward for uh, our cities and citizens 
uh, I don't think this is the most popular opinion that people uh, uh, popular opinion today, but I'm willing to debate that uh, with all of you later on. And the key issue is that, uh, and one thing why I keep on saying is that uh, there are a lot of opinion surveys that are coming out. There is a lot of uh, you know studies of public opinion, uh, public opinion which say that people are becoming more and more aware of the climate threat and how uh, and that you know our current ways of uh, ways of living is completely unsustainable that we have to move away from that uh, so it feels like governments are finally getting ready to uh, ensure that citizens also move towards that uh, space towards shared mobility it could be electric, it could be uh, using some other form of technology, but uh, there seems to be some positive movement from governments and uh, as a professional working in this sector, I am more worried about how citizens are going to react to uh, you know, such uh, curtailing of freedoms uh, on their uh, mobility. Uh, I'm willing to talk more later. Uh, any questions also I'm willing to answer. Uh, thanks Vishnu and thanks uh, CAG for calling me. Uh, firstly, I don't believe in, I am an expert in electricity sector. I just happen to be an engineer uh, who got interested in uh, electricity and got into helping people save electricity by uh, through my initiative called Bijli Bachao. And uh, uh, the first part that was given to me was how do I see uh, electricity sector in 2040. So uh, when we think of 20 years down the line, we try to imagine a lot of science fiction things. We try to believe that uh, cars will fly and we want to see everything to be uh, uh, sci-fi, right? But uh, 20 years is what I feel is not a really long time. It's a very short time, 2000 to 2020 right now. Uh, whatever I have observed, I don't see a huge amount of change. So, uh, when, when you asked about being centralized, semi-hierarchical, mo modular, or decentralized, uh, what I feel is that uh, things will still be very centralized because what I see is that the government policies right now, they are very uh, towards centralized thing. I mean, we would like to see uh, uh, microgrids in rural areas, but uh, we still talk about taking the central grid uh, power to uh, to the rural areas, right? So we are still talking about that, right? So I still feel that it will be very centralized because uh, making it decentralized is a lot of change management and uh, there is a lot of work involved in that, which currently is not happening. Uh, but still, uh, I have uh, three or four themes which I think uh, are very interesting for 2014. Couple of them are for the government, kind of boring, but uh, first thing, I deal with a lot of uh, energy efficient appliances. So I see a lot of scope of uh, improvement uh, in uh, efficiencies of uh, appliances in general, because <coughs> right now we see that a lot of appliances that are used in regular households, are still not mandatorily uh, labeled, right? So there are a lot of appliances which are inefficient, which are going around. In fact, there's a big uh, second hands market which still thrives on uh, inefficient appliances where we need to figure out ways to uh, cut out all the inefficient appliances which are there in the market right now. So we definitely need more policies from the state and the government to weed out all the inefficient appliances, right? Uh, there are certain segments which have certainly improved like uh, air conditioners, refrigerators, especially where we see a lot of international manufacturers, we see a lot of improvement in that, but there is a lot to be done in uh, appliances in segments where we have Indian manufacturers. I mean, we do need to figure out ways to push our Indian manufacturers to adopt energy efficiency. That's one uh, area that I feel that government needs to work on, right? Secondly, uh, I see as a person who works in energy efficiency, 
I see a lot of focus uh, which is there on the supply side. So a lot of initiatives going on for solar, a lot of initiatives going on for renewable energy. There's a lot of push to adopt uh, renewable energy, but something uh, a little more steps need to be done for demand side management, especially considering the fact that uh, we are a developing economy. Uh, if uh, we look at a regular household, I mean, I, I deal with a lot of households, so you'll get a lot of reference from household. So if we look at a regular household, uh, regular middle class household in India, uh, up middle to upper middle class household in India, their power consumption uh, would be about 300 units in a month. But if we look at US, it, uh, a regular middle class house in the US consumes about 3000 units in a month. And that's where we are pushing towards, right? So we are developing our, uh, incre we are increasing the number of appliances that we are consuming, right? So like uh, we talked about uh, cars being electric as well, or scooters being electric as well. So although we are on one side uh, pushing on efficiency, we are also adding a lot of appliances. So we need to make sure that those appliances are efficient as well because our consumption will increase and our needs will increase right and uh, most of this and we'll also be replacing a uh, lot of our uh, production from with renewable right so and renewable is not a 24-7 available uh, source I mean if you look at solar it's available only during the daytime if you look at wind it's only available during limited times right so we definitely need to improve a lot on demand side management right so that is something that uh, we would want government to work on we would want states to work on and we would want a lot more demand side initiatives where simple things right uh, like what ESL is doing right now uh, the pushing of pushing for the super efficient appliances uh, trying to do bulk purchase to bring down the prices of the highly efficient appliances right so those are certain initiatives that governments will have to take lot more right so uh, these are the parts where government will have to come in and government will have to uh, provide inputs but coming to the science fiction part a uh, lot of things uh, smart meters will come in so that's a very exciting thing uh, especially for a technologist like me because i entered this sector because of smart meters to be really frank uh, so smart meters can empower consumers like uh, anything, I mean, there are a lot of initiatives which are going on internationally where people are trying to build uh, uh, itemized billing of electricity bill. I mean, uh, we would definitely want to see some, some time where we can know that in my house, I spent a uh, certain amount on air conditioner, certain amount on refrigerator, certain amount on, let's say, water heating, right? So we definitely want to know, in fact, when I interact with consumers, Everyone wants to know that how much are they spending on each of those appliances and uh, there are uh, people uh, who are building solutions in US especially where they are trying to use the smart meter data to come up with itemized billing right and then in fact what they're trying to do is they're trying to take a signature power consumption of each kind of appliance and tr trying to use smart meter data which is actually measuring instantaneous uh, power consumption to come up with itemized billing. There's another uh, very interesting area which, which is uh, social comparison, right? So where if we can know that if people, uh, how much consumption is there in households uh, which are just like ours, right? So if I, let's say I live in a upper middle class house, 2BHK uh, in Mumbai, I would definitely want to know that how much is the power consumption of a similar house in, uh, in my locality right and if I get to know that uh, this is the kind of average number which people are consuming and mine is higher than that right that will definitely help me out figuring out okay I am doing something wrong right I need to improve right so that's one area where smart meters can help but then another interesting thing which is happening is smart homes now we are uh, involving a lot of IOT devices we are trying to building built in a lot of uh, artificial intelligence in all the appliances that we are uh, trying to use, right? So art, uh, all of it, smart homes can actually complement smart meters 
in helping us uh, optimize our electricity consumption. Uh, very interesting thing that could be like uh, if let's say I use my air conditioners at 20 degrees centigrade and I uh, the ideal temperature which I should be using it at is 25. Uh, a smart meet a smart home device which is actually monitoring my AC can actually uh, tell me how much will I save in terms of rupees because it's actually interacting with the grid as well. It knows my uh, tariffs. It knows uh, how much do I consume. So it can actually help me figure out. Okay, if I change it to 25, I'll save 500 rupees a month, right? That that's something. That's a very valuable input that I can get, right? A smart home device interacting with my AC can also alert me that uh, your, my AC is not working efficiently. I need to clean it. I need to make sure that I, uh, I need to do a maintenance. If I do the maintenance of my AC, I can actually uh, save 500 rupees a month or 400 rupees a month, right? That quantifiable number, if I get, and if I get an alert of that, that can be a really, really good value add for, for the consumer. Similarly, if, if let's say, I have a device which is measuring my air conditioner regularly, right? And it is connected to the internet and it knows that there is a energy efficient air conditioner which is available in the market which is for X amount, right? And if it can tell me that by the way there is an efficient AC in the market, if you purchase it, it can help me, uh, it can get you an ROI in three years, right? So it's a it's a really good value add that that can, that we can have. So that that will enable consumers uh, that that will empower consumers with a lot of information, right? So that kind of futuristic innovations is something that I I visualize because a lot of uh, things are happening in IoT and smart metering space. Uh, another interesting thing which is happening is uh, it's, it's the, is the increase of rental economy, right? So pe people are not buying cars, people are uh, renting it from Ola and Uber and whatnot. Similarly, uh, even in developed countries, people are trying to build solutions where there will be rental of houses, fully uh, self-serviced houses, right? So that's that will also add another dimension. Maybe in future, the rental economy in India grows. A lot of people are now renting appliances as well, right? So uh, rental economy is another aspect which can kind of bring in a challenge with the energy efficiency aspect because the, the whole principal agent problem comes in. So if I, let's say, rent a house, which is a fully furnished house, so the person who owns the house does not have any incentive to implement energy efficiency. But I, as the consumer, will, will be the person who will be paying. So as rental economy grows uh, and people start, rather than owning houses, people start increasingly renting houses. That's another aspect which will play uh, a role, uh, which where we have to figure out how to uh, weed out the inefficient aspects and implement more of efficiency. So that's 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 what that's what I figured out. Uh, we'll discuss more when uh, we have a question and question and answer session. So look forward to your questions. Thank you. A very good morning to all. First of all, thanks to CAG for inviting me to speak and to share the dice with such eminent speakers. Thanks once again. Uh, my name is Richa. I work with Shakti Sustainable Energy Foundation. I'll just give you a brief about what Shakti is. Shakti was established in 2009. It was uh, the first time Endeavor which was established and developed by a philanthropic community in order to foster your policy research in clean energy and climate change mitigation. Uh, since the time it has been developed and established, it has uh, occupied a unique niche in this market and uh, it has always been supporting and advancing uh, uh, advancing solutions to tackle the problem of sustainability and climate change. It has also played a key role in convening the key stakeholders in order to uh, interact with them and build their capacity uh, towards the clean energy pathway. So, uh, starting from few questions which Vishnu has asked me as to uh, what, do I, what do we see as a future, let me just begin with the title of our panel discussion, 
the word reimagine when we use the word reimagine we need to know what has happened in history what is happening right now so the present is what we need to know that is when we reimagine the electricity so uh, historically talking about the journey of electricity sector in india is a time when earlier electricity used to be produced uh, in the pit head plants or near the load centers from that time we and due to the high tnd losses we have now shifted to the transmission grid system so uh, the transition has happened from history to now and when we see and when we envisage the future of electricity sector as 2040 there are many aspects to it first of all talking about the climate change the problem has existed not now but since past it has like existed since 1960s 70s but actions have started taking place only in 2000 when in 2015 first time india signed the paris agreement and agreed on its ndcs that is when amongst the few ndcs which we have signed one of them was to increase the generation of our electricity from non fossil fuels by 40 Uh, 40%. The 2018 data states that yes, the we have been able to uh, achieve 35% of it. So as we are seeing that yes, India is transitioning and yes, the sector is evolving with time. And if we envisage a future of, future of electricity sector in India by 2040, then uh, definitely I believe the decentralized is what could be the future of India. Decentralized includes four aspects to it. to it one is your distributed uh, electricity generation second it includes uh, energy efficiency which has already been pointed out third it includes demand response and fourth is the energy storage that is where the problem we say that yes renewable is not a full time uh, resource right it is very much specific to region as to the source so that is where the role of energy storage comes into picture So uh, I'll just talk about few statistics and the study which was being conducted by Shakti. Uh, so looking at the baseline situation, the 2019 data says that the centralized generation of India was 90 percent and the decentralized was only two percent. And if we see the expected growth of decentralized generation, the 2019 data says that centralized generation was 350 gigawatts, and if we forecast it to 2022, it will be 450. so definitely centralized generation is increasing but if we now look at the decentralized generation data decentralized generation was 10 gigawatt in 2019 and in 2022 it will be 50 gigawatt so yes the increase will be quite high in terms of decentralized generation so yes i believe that that will be a way forward in 2040 uh now looking into uh, one more question which vishnu has asked as to when i say that okay fine decentralized is the way forward and what states will be the role the states will play a role so i believe yes states will play a key role in bringing this evolution because they have the power and also uh, they can come up with robust policy in order to promote these uh, techniques and technologies a uh, few challenges which i feel uh, in terms of 2040 uh, india will face one is uh, i will talk about in terms from the discom perspective so uh, typically these plants are developed for a life of say 20 25 years so when we say by 2040 so then discoms now have to think that if that is the future of electricity sector they have to think what innovative business model they should be working in order to sustain their revenue and business so that is a challenge but then yet again it can be used as an opportunity in 2040 wherein if now they think about those innovative business models in future they can work with the consumers like if consumers become the prosumers of future so that is when the utilities and consumers can work together in integration that was a point on how what i see the challenges and the opportunities in 2040 now comes one of the key role player of our electricity sector that is the consumers uh i believe consumers will be the backbone of electricity sector of future definitely reason being that uh, 
one could be that see when we are saying that we are transitioning from centralized to the de decentralized power generation model then uh, our consumers will no longer be just the consumers they will be the producers and the consumers that is where the term presumers come in so consumers will be the key role player here utilities will actually their future models will be in partnership with consumers where consumers will be their partners in producing and consuming electricity uh, the future consumer will no longer be consumer and also I like to give examples say for example tomorrow if I have an electric car I the future of 2040 electricity sector in India will be that I have electric car I own electric car I can park in my parking lot charge my park car there use it and then further that which will be again connected to the grid the charging station will be connected to the grid that car itself once charged and not in use can then be used to stabilize the grid so that is where the consumer will play the role of a presumer will help in stabilizing the grid and will also play the role of trading electricity in terms of blockchain so battery as a service is what i was trying to convey here and uh, in terms of consumer engagement, so these is what this is what we're trying to say that consumer centric business models should come up in future. And uh, that is where utilities and consumers both can work in, in uh, like if they both integrate together and that is where both models can run in parallel, the consumer centric as well as the discom which are now functioning right now. Uh, what we need also is the seamless communication with consumers. With consumers becoming more and more connected, the mode of interaction with the consumers will also become prominently digital. Consumers will then be able to register their complaints through mobile phones, through handheld devices, and utilities will keep them abreast of the complaint resolution status through interactive alerts. Uh, one more thing could be that we also need a one-stop portal for the consumer needs to be highlighted. There should be a single platform where, you know, all the needs and desires or complaints of the consumer will be highlighted, which is happening now as well. But in future, we want this approach to be very digital, very, very digital. Say, for example, if there is uh, a consumer with very high consumption, the utility will immediately com communicate that to the uh, with the consumer's permission definitely to offer to uh, offer the consumer to uh, to you know sell them smart devices that is going to track uh, and then will communicate uh, about the dynamic tariff structure they have and also will modulate the consumption so such a device will help the consumer to optimize the consumption and reduce their bill that is where during the peak load time they can reduce that is where the concept of demand response and all things we have discussed till now comes in picture uh, one more point which was in terms of when we say in 2040 uh, the power consumers will have more power over utilities or not so i believe that we cannot comment on the power uh, aspect i believe that there's an equilibrium between the two like consumers cannot work without discoms and discoms cannot work without them so there should ideally there should be an equilibrium between the two so we should not be saying that consumers should have more power over discoms or discoms have more power over consumer that is my take on that particular thing and issues which consumers might face in 2040 i particularly feel that uh, when we say consumers becoming presumers of tomorrow there might be competition between consumers itself which could be very competitive and also there could be competition between consumers and discoms but then yet again this competition will be a healthy one this competition will uh, only help to make the sector more better to boon the economy and to boon for the power uh, market and this will lead to an option for free market and better possible power prices in uh, 2040 so i would now take a pause and thank you so much good morning everyone welcome back after yesterday's very interesting interactions we had very interesting interactions yesterday really down to earth now imagine it is 1971 and a young man of 17 years old is cycling in holland the day after a big storm so he is cycling in an area where the lot of trees are there and he finds a lot of trees have come down after that storm. So this young man imagines the power of wind. If wind can take down all these trees, 
then wind also can do something good for mankind. So he goes to the farm of his would-be father-in-law. And in that farmhouse, in the living room, the father-in-law, would-be father-in-law, had kept as an artifact a wooden blade, a wooden windmill blade, just as an artifact in the living room. So he goes with that wooden blade to a carpenter and says, can you make me another one? So that I have two wooden blades and the carpenter makes him a second wooden blade. Then he goes to the flea market and in the flea market he purchases an induction motor and he purchases a cycle wheel rim and a few bolts and nuts. And he tells the father-in-law, now you go to the kitchen and as I shout, you switch on the electric plates, because they had an electric stove, one by one. I will tell you when to do it. So the wind turbine starts rotating. And he tells the father-in-law, okay, switch on plate number one, which was probably 500 watts. So plate number one is switched on. And the meter is still running forward. It was a disc meter. You remember those old disc meters. And then he tells the father-in-law, switch on plate number two. And the father-in-law, by the way, quite scared what's all going to happen to my house, but he does it because, you know, the would-be son-in-law is asking, so he does it. He switches on the second plate and the meter stops going forward. So then it turns out that he is apparently generating power of two plates, of two stoves. Of course, the wind is fluctuating, so sometimes the meter moves forward, the meter moves backward. But this is probably, in the history, the first grid-connected wind turbine in 1971. It has not been recorded in any books, unfortunately. So this young man had the one little problem that this mast, this tower, which was one of the trees that he had found, had a little bent in it. So he was joining the turbine in and out of the wind with two ropes because he had that cycle ring on, rim on top. So he was pulling the wind turbine in and out of the wind with the two ropes. And at one point of time, he turned it in such a manner that the blade hit that little bend in the tower and the blade got broken and the turbine was destroyed. So it lasted for only one hour. But he had proven that you can have grid-connected wind energy. This young man finished his college studies and started a company. He went bankrupt three times. One day, three people in a car arrived at his workshop from a company. Do you all remember the Mentos Suites? Mentos? So that company which was running it at that time, the owners was a company, a family called Van Mellen, Dutch people. Later, they sold the company to Perfetti in Italy. So the Famella brothers were just having a nice Sunday afternoon tour in that area. And they saw this workshop and they walked in and they asked this person, so what are you doing? You know, I'm trying to have a wind turbine company. I already went bankrupt once and I have a lot of problems, but I want to succeed. How much money do you need? And he said, he, whatever he told, he said, I need 100,000 guilders, but still the guilders, not the euros and they became the investors in this company, these three brothers. The name of this person is Hank Lagerwey. Hank Lagerwey is one of the pioneers of wind energy in Europe. He was given a royal award last year. I was invited, I, I was present when it was given to him. And that is how actually at that scale, how wind energy started. 25 kilowatt, 80 kilowatt, 250. 750, 1.5 megawatt, 2 megawatt, 3 megawatt, and now it has gone to 4 megawatt. Grid connected wind and standalone wind. He used to sell the 80 kilowatt wind turbine, they are still running, to farmers. Farmers would put those wind turbines on their land, connect them to the grid to have a little extra income. I asked him one day, how did you manage the working capital? Oh, very simple, he said. My boys would install the wind turbine. They would give me a call from the farm when the wind turbine was installed. I would ask them, give the phone to the farmer. I would ask the farmer, is it running? Yes, it is running. Please give my boys the money. 
and they would get paid immediately. Now, that is the journey of wind energy. The journey of solar energy started with standalone solar, small panels, one single panel, 50 watts, even less, a small battery bank, and solar has gone now to the grid connected segment. We have standalone and we have grid connected solar all over the place. Now, where is this going to lead to? I, I was wondering why 2040, because everybody has targets for 2022, 2050. Then I figured out in 20 years from now, he is in his midlife crisis. <laughs> so he wants to be sure that the energy story at least is taken care of. Why 2040, I was wondering. But OK, my vision of 2040, 100% renewable energy, 100, completely 100%, distributed, indeed distributed. Distributed means not only 5 kilowatt and 10 kilowatt, it can also be 1 megawatt, 2 megawatt, but distributed all over the place. Because what is the nice thing about the sun, as I mentioned yesterday, the sun is the only source of energy, period. And secondly, it is the only source of energy which generates, transmits and distributes. You stick your hand out of the window and you catch the sun. You don't have to go anywhere. For wind, you have to go to windy areas. For hydro, you have to go to the hills. For coal, you have to go to the coal mines, but for wind, for solar, you don't have to go anywhere. It comes to you every day. In fact, the, the very good tradition of doing a Surya Namaskar is a very good tradition because it is also a Namaskar to the only source of energy that we have. Everything runs on the sun. So 100% renewable energy, solar, wind, all the sources available. Distributed storage is also my dream for 2040. Storage is very much needed, as you also mentioned, because without storage, we cannot have 100% renewable energy. It's very simple. Regional grids, remote demand management. Now, what is remote demand management? That was already mentioned in earlier. You can go one step further than what you said. What they do in California, you can actually, as a vol you can volunteer for it. They won't do it uh, without your knowledge that you say, OK, I participate in this scheme whereby they will switch off your air conditioner remotely if they need to flatten the load curve. And how do they do that? They look remotely at the temperature in your room. So they find that they say 24, 23. They say, well, no problem. This can be switched off. And later, when the temperature rises, again, we switch them off. Somebody else will get it at that time. So by doing that, you can flatten the load curve or you can even shift the peak to another time. That is remote demand management. I see a new role of the grid in 2040. The grid is no longer that one-way highway from big power stations to millions of consumers. The grid becomes a balancing system. You see, there are some people who go, in my view, a little bit too far, who say we should get rid of the grid. That is not the right approach. You still need the grid, but for a different purpose. The grid is no longer a one-way highway. It is a multi-directional highway which connects people and connects systems. Very simple example, in the afternoon at 2.30, your battery is full, but your neighbor's is not. And the sun, the sun is still shining. So why to waste that solar energy? Let it get exported to the grid and be useful to somebody else. It is like interconnecting water tanks. Don't be selfish and have only your own water tank connected to the system. Another reason why you still need a grid, if you don't have a grid, then everyone has to design storage for the worst case scenario. Everyone. So everyone has to have storage for that horrible situation where there is a cyclone and we have one week no power. You need huge storage. Whereas if there is a grid, there will be an area where there is still power. It can be transported here. So the grid is very much needed, but it gets a new role to play. Discoms in 2040 will only be discoms. They will only distribute they will have as their core business to keep that highway in a good condition. That new grid, they have to, that is the only business they will have. They won't generate. They won't even transmit. Transmission will be a different vertical in the system. And I would recommend that, especially in the transmission network, the governments keep a majority stake. But in discoms, it really doesn't matter who owns the discom. It can be owned by anyone, provided there is a regulator who makes sure that there is equity, that everyone has access to the system, 
and that there is renewable sustainable energy for all, not for a few. That is the regulator's role. Local communities in 2040 will operate local grids themselves. Those local grids are connected to the major grids. They will manage storage systems in their community. They will manage solar plants in their community. They will manage micro wind turbines if there is a, uh, sufficient wind. But these can be community-owned systems. There is a very interesting book which uh, Raghuram Rajan has written. And I'm just almost finished reading it. It's called The Third Pillar. I recommend you read it. It is the three pillars are the state, the market, and the community. And he says we have left the community behind in our growth. So he brings, he wants that the community comes back, back. And the community has to come back also in energy. What is the role of the state was one of the questions. The role of the state, of course, in this new paradigm is to make sure that everyone has access, that everyone can produce energy, everyone can consume energy, everyone can store energy. We go, in fact, one step more than the prosumer. It becomes a pro store because he also has to, the consumer also has to store energy now. The, the, the scope of work becomes much larger. And that is again possible because renewable energy can, in most cases, especially in the case of solar, can be uh, generated everywhere. What is then the role of us, the consumers? Is to get rid of this label of being a consumer, first of all. We are not consumers. We are also producers. We may have our own systems or we might have offered our roof or garden to somebody else to put solar. We don't have to necessarily own it. There is the RESCO model already. But we are going to play a totally different role than we have been in the past. In the past, we were only consuming. Now we will produce, we will share, and we will store. Lastly, what is the role of the present, this, the present utilities? As I mentioned, in my view, the discoms should only be only be operating distribution systems. In fact, we keep on telling the very uh, interesting, good team, the management team of uh, Tanjetko, whenever we met them, we say, you have two assets, people and wires. You have very good people. I mean, many of them have been in the field and grown all the way. They know the system very, very well. The same thing applies to the electricity department of Pondicherry. Mr. Anthony is here. They have very good people. And they have wires. Wires, of course, means the whole system. We keep on telling them, focus on those two assets. You don't need to own generation assets. Buy the power from anyone in the, in the market or, or you know, from all sources. But make your financial resources available to keep the distribution network in a good shape. You remember in California, the crisis that California had, when was that? Ten years ago was not a generation crisis, it was a distribution crisis because they had ignored to update and maintain the distribution system. So Tanjetko, for example, should have a strong balance sheet allowing them to maintain a very good distribution system with smart meters and all what we have mentioned before. I think I will keep it at this for the time being and we will make sure that your midlife crisis will be a very smooth one, 2040. <laughs> Good morning to all of you. And when Vishnu rang me up, uh, I was in Bangalore and not too keen to come down. I just came back there for yesterday. But I remembered Vishnu, irreverent, divisive research scholar when I met him. And he still remains so, which is such a compliment to you. And uh, when he sent me the questions, I thought uh, Vishnu has not changed and I'm glad. I have come, even though I missed a very good session yesterday, I do realize that. But there's a lot that's going on in energy. As Richard knows, on 4th, they've had uh, four studies done on decarbonization, which is on looking at road transport, uh, looking at construction and various other sectors. But when I took a look at the questions, and I thought I'll try to answer them, and I also realized when I heard all the technologists, these were the same arguments my technologists gave to me when I was with the APRC. And somewhere, the economics and the human angle got lost. I know my friend from Oroville had a much more human angle to it. But that's a very critical thing in the electricity. 
Richard said we're reimagining, uh, and therefore what is the past? But she doesn't realize I came from a family where my father was in the private sector generating company. Then I went into the public sector, which is when it got nationalized and he gave up his job. And I'm now coming back again to private individual electricity companies, not companies, consumers or whichever way you want to take it. So this sector is something that affects all of us in different ways. It is all over and it has different changes depending on the situation that comes back. So the, the first question asked is, what is the vision for 2040? Now, everyone loves to talk about renewable energy, clean air, clean energy, uh, which there's nothing wrong in it. It's very nice to have clean air. I come from Delhi, where I can tell you it's awful. And that has got nothing to do with electricity. It has got to do with farmers burning their rice crop, which I, from the south, have never seen it being burnt. So I don't know what the logic is works. Does it have to do with cars? Does it have to do with transport? No. You did mention that diesel is less polluting than electricity. Of course, it was generated from coal. It will be definitely more polluting. So, you know, there's no one answer to anything. And Delhi was held till it rained. Even now, I think our uh, parameters of pollution are very high and one cannot breathe. So, the idea of even if you think of a decentralized modular renewable energy is a vision for 2040. I also think that there are a lot of problems with this sort of decentralization which has been mentioned because anything that is so decentralized and modular one has to go for storage batteries. When you go for storage batteries is a question of the lithium being got into it and India does not have an advantage in that. It is China which has the advantage somehow we have not got that advantage as yet. So the idea of committed energy becomes very difficult in this country. We can never be completely decentralized and I'm glad you mentioned it because the grid is very important. And the point that was made, which I agree, the transmission will be another vertical and the discounts would only look at wires in business. But here, the point that comes up and which is important is, is that can consumers be producers? I'll leave that to the end because that's a very conflicting thing that has to look at who is a consumer. A producer is also a consumer and one who doesn't produce is also a consumer. So there are problems that are involved into it and uh, basically what one has to look at a decentralized system while all the technical experts have talked about the technology and perhaps the high costs that are going to be involved in it. You know to get microgrids to strengthen your grid system to be able to even say, yes, I agree, the transmission sector could be kept into the public sector, but it has to have competition. And that has to be through for competition for the market and not in the market. You know, the question of bidding and price bidding. And one went through all of it in the Andhra Pradesh Electricity Regulatory Commission. I think we were one of the most dynamic commissions that took place. And well, things have a way of changing, states break up and all that happens. But what let us look at it is the link between electricity and politics. What is this institutional link and why is it that the discoms become so important? And why do I have to keep maintaining and referring it to again? Uh, Navroz and Swain have discussed a lot of it. Their work has been really on this question of it. While I do partly agree with it, was one thing that was told to me right from the beginning. You know, we had rescos in Andhra. We've had all, we've tried everything. We've tried consumers. We've tried to give consumers a specialized tariff if they would buy green energy and sell it into the grid. All that was done earlier in times, they're coming back again. But nonetheless, what happens is, do consumers have a choice in this strategy of decentralized uh, modular that you are talking? And again, I must emphasize, it can never be completely decentralized. It has to be centralized to a large extent. It's a very strange thing. Um, one of the persons who persuaded you to invite me was Uday. And Uday has done a study and he's come out with his op-ed on consumers in Rajasthan. And he says consumers are not aware about electricity. As far as my knowledge goes, every consumer knows about electricity and how much he pays for it. 
either that the Rajasthani consumer couldn't care because he doesn't pay anything or he is just, he's just Rajasthani, which is very strange. Because everyone knows about electricity, everyone knows how much they have to pay, everyone wants free electricity, everyone wants to be subsidized and that's where the politics comes. Because electricity became distributive welfare. It has got nothing to do with distributive production, it's got to do with distributive welfare and people want the government to subsidize and certain groups and classes are subsidized. I want to make clear there's nothing wrong in subsidizing people who need the subsidy. It is absolutely important. I who come from JNU say that make education of universities completely free. I have no objection to it at all. But when you want to be able to subsidize, you get into the game of cross subsidy, which is not a good thing, which is where the evils of the discom come in. It can be given subsidized, but it can be done through a different route. But no political party wants to do it through the direct subsidy or getting it digitalized and straight to the consumer because what they're interested is in votes. So this is the kind of politics that discoms are placed on. And therefore, when you look at it, I would now try to look more at this act. I am from the electricity sector. I will look at the Electricity Regulatory Commission. I will look at the Electricity Act and what is the kind of new act that one wants. Some of you have hinted at it, but let's go back to the present act because the new act didn't get modified or go through. See, the, the whole Electricity Act, the entire design of the Electricity Act was on the question of commercialization and on the question of getting the private sector involvement. But it also went on to a basic structure which says that it has been framed in what is known as a natural monopoly. The only natural monopoly existing are the wire segment. So that is what has to be set up. So in a principal and agent, which is what the Electricity Regulatory Commission is, that the Electricity Regulatory Commissions will have to fix the tariff for licensed activities. They do not know what the cost of transmission is because it's the principal and the agent because the, the agent will never tell you what his costs are and so the principal is continuously guessing and fixing the tariff. This is the natural monopoly concept. But a distribution company which not only has the distribution wires but also the question of distributing electricity among consumers becomes a license and we gave licenses for 23 years, their tariffs have to be fixed under the Act. There is no escaping. If you are a licensed activity, the tariff will be fixed by the Electricity Regulatory Commission. Fair enough. So the distribution companies then started playing the game of subsidy, cross-subsidy and politics of every government started coming into the distribution company. When the Electricity Regulatory Commissions were fresh and young and new, they were very independent. But finally, every commission is a commission set up by the government. You cannot escape it. There's some amount you can do and that's the story that goes on. So what am I trying to look at? We are now looking at consumer choice. I don't want to go back. The technologist has told me the whole thing. You know, Abhishek, you're just like the young fellow who was with me, who went on to your very good ideas. But you told me, you know, ma'am, I keep looking at the meat and seeing which one I should use. As a consumer and as a woman who has to run a household, my transaction costs are much more higher than that electricity bill I pay. I'm not going to look at the meter. This fellow says, you know, I don't run the geyser because it consumes a lot. So I burn water on the electricity stove. So I said, what about cooking breakfast for your family? What about sending lunch? That's a transaction cost. It doesn't take place. So you see, there's a trade-off. A consumer and the consumer preferences and the smart grid are very important. I also agree that the application of AI and IoT is extremely important. But there are limitations when you have consumers and consumer preferences. And I'm sure many of the ladies here will agree with me that for us it's much more important to get the morning headache off than worry on what the smart grid is saying. See, one has to build in these preferences. It is also interesting to look at it is that what is the issue that the Electricity Regulatory Commission can do? Under the Act, there is no competition in the Electricity Regulatory Act. 
the word competition is used. But there is no such thing as to how you will bring about competition. This is the same problem with the Telephone Regulatory Authority of India. These were the two sector regulators which came up right in the beginning with economic liberalization because it meant that if you had a regulator, you distance the state from the, uh, the, the producers and the transmitters of electricity. It was a distancing the regulatory commissions had to look after and this distancing has got narrowed down. So coming to this is when you look at the present Electricity Act and I said any licensed activity will have to be regulated. One will then have to look at our decentralized energy systems. Does it mean they will also be regulated? Because generation is not licensed. But generation has to get a clearance from the Ministry of Power for environment. And if generation is not licensed, then perhaps it's not required. But if you don't want generation to be licensed and you want decentralized energy, the only way that you could allow for it to come up, uh -uh, that is where the trick lies. Because there's something known as Section 42 of the Electricity Act, which states very clearly that if you touch the transmission line or the network of any of the licensees, you have to pay a cross-subsidy surcharge. And as my lawyer friends have told me, the cross-subsidy surcharge, which I kept arguing and arguing with Ram Chandran till the heavens came falling down, that it should be a small amount. No, it has to be the entire amount. So who is going for any other energy? If you're going to pay a cross-subsidy surcharge, and this 42 C, I think, is what became very important for the distribution companies. And this is what the government played upon. So we built up this model cost to serve on cross-subsidy and try to see how we can reduce the cost for the persons who are the consumers who have to be subsidized or the sectors that have to be subsidized. And then the concept of decentralized energy also came in. But there, when you bring in terms of decentralized energy, there are stressed assets. The PPAs earlier for 20 years, now they've been reduced to 10 and I think 5 years, but still there are stressed assets which have to be borne by the consumer. How can those stressed assets be taken care of? But, uh, you know, the, the, the whole thing about this distribution and the act was a question of open access 42 and the question of stressed assets and the question of licensed activity. So when they talk about competition, the only sections that I notice from the Act is Section 66, Section 23, Section 72, 2 and Section 135. My friend Raja would know them better than I would, but it does not help. So even I, the point that was said is very well taken. One more section? Five, five, five minutes? Okay, I'll get out. What do you do about it? Is this the domain of the ERC? No. Competition is the domain of the Competition Commission of India. If it is going to be the domain of the Competition Commission of India, the only job that the ERCs will have to do is to try and use their technical talent or their technical knowledge as to how wires should be maintained, how the transmission should be maintained, how generation should be maintained. By creating markets, creating competition is the job of the Competition Commission of India because the Competition Commission of India has the statutory right to fine and to penalize. Otherwise, what happens, and we've seen a few cases, all of them will prefer to go to the ERC because the ERC has no right to fine except beyond 60 lakhs. 10% or 3% of the turnover of the firm. And it has a right to penalize, it has a right to suggest remedies. In this case, what I would suggest is that rather than allow for forum shopping, it is very important that the ERC and the TRI get combined with the Competition Commission. The Competition Commission becomes much larger, has different wings to it. And the last uh, issue also, which Richard Rage was a question of consumers. I'll bring up one case. In two minutes, I'll give you three cases which are very important. You can look at it. Is that a consumer normally in India has to go to the consumer court. A single consumer cannot come to the competition commission. So we need a much wider competition commission. 
And how many economists do we have in the Competition Commission? Three. How many lawyers we have? They're stuffed with lawyers. <laughs> so what do we do? Lawyers are very good, very intelligent, but they don't understand the economics either of competition or of the regulatory act because their job is to win the case. It's not to prove a point. Lastly, three cases or four cases I'll give because I've been told I have only two minutes, but perhaps Raja, you would like to look at it. One was a famous case which came up before CCI called the National Cooperative Consumer Federation versus Newtown Electricity and the WBERC. You know, this was the question where the consumers of this new town were demanding a regular supply of electricity continuously and there was one man fighting and WBERC kept avoiding it and then the case came to the competition commission. The commission dropped the case. Why? They said this is a class, it's a consumer complaint and not a class complaint. I think that's something that the commission should have taken up and fought through. Then came another very interesting case of the Anila Gupta. Anila Gupta was in Mumbai, we was in Mumbai and Raja kept bringing up this case. Anila Gupta wanted to use section 42 and shift to uh, avail of open access and shift to Tata from Best because their tariffs were much lower while Best owned the whole area of Mumbai. And then the competition commission in the initial stages said it will not be possible because under section 43, remember whether you like it or not, best is considered a cooperative society. And a cooperative society does not need to give open access. Strange, no? Mumbai is under a cooperative society. Then it went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court took the decision that under the, uh, the contract of 42, section 42 of universal obligation, Read with 43, Anila Gupta should be allowed to transfer and after many years was allowed to transfer. But see how the whole process goes on and how law comes up. The final two cases, one is the best versus Tata power. There was this entire argument because best owns no generating station, Tata power owns and when they were shifting to repairs and maintenance, they sold more expensive power. Tata power sold more expensive power to best and the case came up before the commission and then there is a case of the Surendra Prasad who was a trader selling coal to Mahajan Co and said there was price bidding and price rigging. So all these are cases that have come to the commission and it's worthwhile looking at it and we have before us a, a, a very well known lawyer in the area of e e electricity act and the electricity commission. My own submission here is yes. Some amount of decentralization is possible. I am not too sure it's going to be renewable energy because let's not forget we are self-sufficient in coal even if we have a lot of solar power as you mentioned. Wind is a terrible thing. In one place in Andhra Pradesh is 15% PLF and another place is 2% PLF. It's a big show off. I mean it's really not worth it. Solar is the one that one could think of but our dependence is going to be on coal. That coal is what the country has. It may have to be washed coal. If, if you're thinking of clean energy, one shouldn't rule out the possibility of it. Completely modular system and decentralizations becomes very difficult because consumers, if they have to make a choice, their choice depends upon having the state in the form of the regulatory commission. But the regulatory commission has to undergo a change. On that, I'm quite convinced and the act has to be rewritten and become part of the Competition Commission. Thank you. I'm going to slightly reimagine the questions which uh, Vishnu had asked us to look into. Uh, this is because I think all five speakers um, have talked about where technology will take us in the next five years. But the question that I want to ask myself and possibly ask all of you is, Given the current status of the Electricity Act, the manner in which it has been drafted, the manner in which it has been assembled, the manner in which it has been put together and the foundations on which it rests, whether it will take us there, right? Thankfully, nobody has come up with something like this Malthus prediction, you know, in 1850 Malthus said that uh, world population will explode so much that all of us will be standing on each other's shoulders. Now that didn't happen because the world did take note of what was happening and they brought in a whole lot of things to, there is family planning and a whole lot of thought bestowed on that and so that didn't happen. 
So, thankfully there are no uh, uh, doomsday predictors here. So, uh, but it is important for us to understand that energy sector is extremely important uh, for the growth of the nation. In fact, there is an excellent writer, I do not know how many of you have read him, is a person called Fareed Zakaria, he is basically from Pakistan, he is from India, then is basically a Pakistani who is in US. He has written an excellent book in which he says that, you know, in the last 150 years, the uh, fight was between capital and labor, right? And that is all gone. We had entire political systems which came to be established on the basis of this uh, fight between capital and labor. All that is gone. I mean, if you have money today in Manhattan, you can get labor in China, possibly vice versa. So he said that, um, therefore, what is going to matter to uh, for uh, nations to achieve supremacy in this century is just two things. One is ideas. Ideas is our, what will fuel the growth of a country and a nation. And the second is access to energy, right? He said just these two, concentrate on just these two and your nation will progress. Unfortunately, none of our universities rank within the even first 300 of the world ranking, uh, 150 years. I mean, if you want to blame the British, yes, possibly we could say that uh, 150 years of British rule did make us all glorified clerks and file pushers and creative thinking has gone out of the window. The second is that uh, we, we give very little um, attention to energy. And if you are not going to be able to address these two challenges, we are going to be left behind in the, in the progress which this century is going to see. Now, as far as energy is concerned, it is, it is my very, very strong opinion that the Electricity Act, uh, Gauri did mention that and uh, I, I would completely agree with her that the way the Electricity Act is today framed, it is not going to take us on this path of reforms which we are planning. That is primarily because the Electricity Act does, I was in 2003, I was one of those who were, who was, you know, terribly enthused by the 2003 Act uh, on account of the use of just one phrase. It said that the Electricity Act will distance the working of the uh, SEBs from the uh, from the government. So, I thought what a great idea. But I now realize how foolish it was that enthusiasm because electricity is part of a democratic process and it is very foolish for you to try and distance yourself from that democratic process because ultimately they will get to you and you will never be able to safeguard from you, yourself from that position and that is all plain theory. So, I think that we need to realign the Electricity Act and make it part of our economic and democratic development. Unless we do that, I just, uh, I am going to cite five instances to show why insulating or trying to insulate the electricity sector from this democratic process has not yielded results in five of the most crucial areas. I am going to give it to you with examples. In 2000, uh, Consumer Action Group went to court because uh, the 1998 Electricity Commission Act had been uh, uh, enacted. Notwithstanding that, it was the government which in 2000 fixed the tariff. So, CAG went to court on a writ petition which said two things. It said that you need to establish the Electricity Regulatory Commission. If the Electricity Regulatory Commission is not established in uh, Tamil Nadu, no tariff can be fixed. And secondly, we challenged the fixation of tariff. The court agreed with us on count one and it directed the establishment of the Electricity Regulatory Commission, which is how the Electricity Regulatory Commission came into being. But in count two, it said, okay, let us forgive the government once. I mean, they made a mistake, it is all right. So, uh, the tariff fixation was allowed to stay. So, here we have a problem that notwithstanding the very specific terms of the act, the court did not intervene and set aside the tariff. This is a part of your governance structure and a problem. The judiciary is still operates on the basis of the 1949 Act and the provisions of the 1949 Act with some uh, uh, changes that came in 1962, but this is still the mindset. Second, 2008 to 2012, there was severe uh, electricity crunch in Tamil Nadu. So, the Tangent Co, without consulting the Electricity Regulatory Commission, brought out a whole set of what they called restriction and control measures. Now, this is completely against the provisions of the Act. The Act on the other hand says, the Electricity Regulatory Commission shall be such empowered bodies 
that if they find that any of the SEVs are not functioning on the basis of the principle set out in the Act, the administration of the SEV shall be dislodged and a, uh, you know, a more effective team put in place. Tell me one state in which this has happened. Right? The most important provision of the Act has never been implemented in any part of the state. So ultimately politics is bigger than your uh, commission, it is bigger than your Act. So politics has ensured and when we went to the Electricity Regulatory Commission and argued this issue that you have no power to do it, Electricity Regula Regulatory Commission did an incredible thing. It said it is a very important point, we will eventually consider it. When did they say this? They said it in 2009, they are yet to consider it. Right? So, Still, the electricity regulator, uh, the, 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 the licensee as it is called, the electricity uh, board is still empowered to come up with restriction and control measure. How on earth are they doing it? Under what provision of the uh, act are they doing it? So nobody raises these questions. These questions are not raised in the assembly at all. Right? So second instance to show that politics is bigger than whatever act that you may uh, put in place. I always say that in India, the word act is very easy to achieve as a noun, but very difficult to achieve as a verb. You know, everything is an act. Uh, so you have a crisis, immediately the government will come up with a fantastic act, but it stays as a noun. To transform it to a verb, very rarely happens. So this is the second instance. The third instance is appointment of the chair, chair, chairman of the Electricity Regulatory Commission. This again is an issue on which we have gone to court. We have challenged this and said that the act uh, looks at two possibilities. Now, what is the basic, uh, what do you basically need to for the Electricity Regulatory Commission to be effective? You need an independent regulator. Well, I used to have a physics master who used to so use an uh, important term, he used to say, underline it thousand times. So, this independent has to be underlined thousand times, right? But where is the independence? We had, uh, I think, uh, Ms. Gauri will know about Mr. G.P. Rao, who was the first chairman of your uh, Andhra Pradesh Electricity Regulatory Commission. Uh, the Andhra Pradesh government did not pay the subsidy. And uh, the, the tariff fixation has to be paid in advance for the uh, you know, fixation to happen. They did not make the payment. So he went and attached the secretariat. That is the independence that you want. The finance minister came, came running to the chief minister. Chief minister said nothing doing, go up, appeal to him. So he went and asked the secretary to fix up a meeting to meet him in person. He said nothing doing. I passed an order, which is a uh, order which I am uh, passing in exercise of my powers under the act. You want to say something, you come to the commission, get it to the witness box and tell me. So he made the uh, you know finance uh, secretary uh, come to the court and to plead, uh, you know, uh, extenuating circumstances and then he gave some installments for the payment to be. That is the type of independence that you need for this act to be effective. Unfortunately, we have not had that type of an independent regulator. So the third instance and every time we have ch we challenged it before the Supreme Court, the first round was successful. In region power, the Supreme Court said, uh, judgment uh, delivered by Justice uh, Mr. Nariman, he said it can only be, uh, um, you know, headed by a retired High Court judge, only for this purpose of uh, independence. I am not saying anything uh, in terms of knowledge, in terms of expertise, in terms of competence that a High Court judge is better than a bureaucrat or a person who has been part of the electricity sector. But by the very nature of their operations, the very uh, manner in which they have uh, discharged their duties, there is a level of independence which you can expect from a High Court judge. But ultimately, uh, though we won the case then, in the second round of litigation, the Supreme Court said, uh, no, it need not be, uh, you know, even though the Act gives that as, as an option, the court said that no, it need not be headed by a High Court judge. But we partially won because it said that of the three members, one must have a legally trained mind. So today we have in the commission a district judge as one of the members of the commission. Third is valuation of subsidies. You know, in 2012, this is once again an, a point that I argued before the commission. Uh, I argued this position that the government is supposed to come up with the, between the government and the electricity board, they are come up, supposed to come up with the value of the subsidies. So how do you know this valuation is right? On the other hand, the controller and auditor general uh, there was a report in the Hindu which I take, took before the um, regulatory commission and said that they said that 12,000 crores is the value of the, your subsidy and all that you have given is 3,500 crores. So how on what basis is this valuation right? 
Unfortunately, once again, they said there are judgments to show that uh, Comptroller and uh, Auditor General's report is just a, um, you know, it's, it's just a preliminary document and you can't treat it as final. I very much suspect that any of the valuation of these subsidies are anywhere close to being accurate. So there, once again, the government has a role and a control over the manner in which the sector is going to perform. We have not been able to do anything about it. There is, uh, 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 there are many more. The, but what I am mentioning, the fifth, which is very important, section 108 of the uh, Electricity Act, just that one provision has the power to completely mutilate the scheme of the Act and to ensure that it becomes, because there it says that in the discharge of which powers of the Electricity Regulatory Commissions, the state governments have the power to issue directions in public interest. And it also says if there is to be a question as to whether a particular directive is in public interest, the decision of the state government shall be final. So that one provision has the power to completely mutilate the uh, provisions of the Electricity Act. Thankfully, the Supreme Court and SAI, Power Energy and other cases have said that uh, while yes, the Act does say that, they uh, infused a whole lot of safeguards into that process. They said government can't make these statements without consulting the Electricity Regulatory Commission. So, and if you consult the Electricity Regulatory Commission, you have to ensure, uh, if you have to give reasons as to why you do not agree with the Electricity Regulatory Commissions, those reasons will have to be recorded. That record of those re reasons, once again, is subjected to judicial review, etc., etc. So, in uh, the, the government is now trying to review that judgment to the Supreme Court. It was supposed to come up last month, uh, matter didn't reach. So, if the Supreme Court reviews that, and says the act says that what can I do and throw some its hands then that's the end of all regulatory regime. We are back at the mercy of the politicians and the bureaucrats. I would also like to point out in the issue of subsidy uh, fix a tariff fixation itself. Once again, we argued this matter before the uh, um, Aptel and the Aptel gave an excellent judgment. I even remember the date 11, 11, 2011 where it said that even if the licensee does not come before the commission and seek for uh, refixation of tariff, it is an annual exercise which the commission shall take on every year and shall fix the tariff, right. From 2011 till 2019, I think only twice the tariff has one partially and once full -fledged. So here you have a judgment of Aptel which every state commission across the country has to uh, implement, none of them have implemented. So, once again, this is a failure of the scheme of the act. We are not able to distance the government or the political class from these decisions because these are, the, the electricity is something which touches the life of the common man. And it is very, very difficult to think that the political class is going to keep away from aspects relating to electricity. There are many more. For example, one of the things that we keep going before the Electricity Regulatory Commission is every year you want the licensee to file the ARR, the annual revenue requirement. In annual re revenue requirement, what do they do? Uh, out of 100 rupees, I buy coal at 60 rupees, I pay wages at 10 rupees, um, you know, I uh, give subsidy and so, so on and so forth. So that's the annual requirement. Now, I, we ask them, for example, coal. You know, Coal is a commodity in the world market today. You know the prevailing price of coal if you go to economic times will give you the price of the prevailing price of coal. And we question if this is the prevailing price of coal, how is it that Tangent Co has purchased it at thrice the value? That's a huge uh, you know, source of corruption. And we question that what do uh, electricity regulatory commission say? Our job is to see whether there has been a submission of various components that go into the ARR and not to do an investigation as to whether those are right. Partially that has been done, sometimes in respect of wages, they, they do look at it. On the one hand, you want consumers to move away from the grid. On the other hand, you want that bureaucrat who is in charge of tangent Co to maximize profits for that company. These both are not going to happen. Suppose you incentivize him and tell him the CEO of tangent Co will be entitled to 100% revision in his salary if so many consumers move out of the grid every year. So you have to incentivize him. How are you incentivizing him? By saying, bring me more and more business. Then he shuts down power when there is a power generation. He does a whole lot of things which are completely 
anti competitive and as uh, uh, ms gauri would tell you the the purpose of a competitive commission is to preserve competition and not the competitors but the electricity regulatory commission unfortunately functions to preserve the competitor it doesn't function to preserve the competition so this uh, therefore incentivizing bureaucracy how do we no, allow that to happen second is how do we incentivize a politician this can happen through a positive process negative process Pos negative process uh, punjab is a perfect example punjab they used to you know offer free electricity but it reached a point where if you don't have free electricity uh, what happens then the supply of electricity comes down if it supply of electricity comes down what do you do you depend on diesel generators if you depend on diesel generators it is going to push the cost of your farming uh, exercise so it reached a point of diminishing returns so today somebody goes to punjab and says i'll give you free electricity he gets booted out so it has come to that and it is also so deleterious to environment because in tamil nadu during this 2008 2000 nobody would know when the electricity would come so what would the farmer do he will just switch on the motor and go to bed the the electricity would come at 12 in the night and will run till 4 in the morning and unnecessarily it need not run for more than an hour but it will run for 4 hours which is also reducing the ground water table so it has an effect of on environment also so these are um, we need to also see Uh, how to incentivize the politician? He is an excellent politician. He is a, he is a you know panchayat leader, and uh, he uh, had a near Pollachi, Srinivasan, and he had his uh, panchayat was in the uh, corridors, the wind corridor. So he applied to a bank in the name of the panchayat to put up a windmill. So the bank refused and said we haven't recognized the panchayat as an entity to lend loans. So he came came to the high court, got an order, he established. and every month that panchayat is getting lakhs of rupees from the generation of wind so this is incentivizing the politician to invest in the reforms so the last i'll stop with this how do we uh, educate the bureaucracy the judiciary on this this is the, these are all uh, emerging uh, facets of law and as uh, ms gauri quite rightly said then if you have only lawyers looking at it Uh, the judges in the supreme court are not going to understand these nuances one of the most deleterious judgments i would say is ptc where they say that even after i make a contract through a regulation i can uh, make an inroad into the contract then who will invest in our country if i you know if i enter into a contract with you for 20 years this is a matter of economics it's not a matter of law and you say that halfway through playing the big game i can trip you and you can fall it's all right nobody is going to come to play with this so these are aspects on which i think we should uh, think about and uh, hopefully cag will also do something everybody thanks for this wonderful session uh, my question is to um, either ma'am and to ma'am um, i would like to understand that if you are thinking about grid in the future as more of uh, sorry the discom in the future as more of a entity which does grid management and maybe act as a battery backup for all sorts of consumers and consumers um, then what is our thought in terms of tariff determination Like because if we don't change from the current way the tariffs are determined for the discom, which is below what our base, which is basically sales, the incentive to make to do more sales to sell more below what our and therefore to make more money. In the future, probably that that is not going to help because if we don't change that, then there will always be this sort of competition between the discom and the prosumers because the discom would not like to give away or to have someone who can actually take away the below what our from them. and the other question is to abhishek uh, uh, when the populist kind of uh, measures are going up probably in every state that we see about free power to residential consumers how do that goes along with energy efficiency kind of signals asked an extremely valid question uh, the point is that it will always get converted to pure water as i mean uh, tariff they finding it converted into that if they are going to sell the power that's the point now when i'm talking about um, a discom you see under section 14 we gave them a license even for the sake of consumers but a discom becomes important and why a certain amount of centralization is required is not because of the fact not only because that to maintain the grid and the micro grid and try and help the market development and facilitate the selling and buying because market means trading but because of the fact that if there are any outages how do you handle these outages the interesting thing you should observe 
how much is charged for electricity for outages into captive generation? It's almost 10 times the cost. Now, the distribution company and the model that is coming out, as I said, gets linked up to electricity and politics and how we will be able to work it out or whether we should work it out or not is really what Raja was trying to address. And I must say, Tamil Nadu kept saying we are the most efficiently run electricity uh, board in this country. But in favour of Tamil Nadu, let me tell you, consumers were willing to pay the tariff. They, all the consumers were very conscious of the fact that electricity you have to pay for and therefore, unlike the case that was given of Rajasthan, the consumers in Tamil Nadu are very, very literate in the sense of knowing what is to be done and how it is to be paid. <clears throat> in that scenario where discom would only be a discom, your question is how do we get a kilowatt hour price? <clears throat> in that scenario, there will be more players. One player will own a transmission network, say 230 kV and above. In that, <clears throat> my recommendation would be that the government keeps a majority stake to make sure that it is used for everyone equally. Then there are the distribution companies who own the distribution network. And they make their money by charging the third player, who is the service provider, for the electricity that they sell to you and me. So you can be living in, this, in the same street as me. You buy power from one service provider, I buy from another one. Mine will be maybe you know a, a service provider who sells only green power. Yours may be a service provider who sells mixed power. And those service provider pay the distribution company for every kilowatt hour that they transport over the network to you and me. The regulator will fix the tariff based on the same parameters as today by taking the cost of generation and the cost of distribution and the cost of transmission. So that is how the kilowatt hour price still gets fixed, but it is no longer a single ARR by one discom. It is multiple companies who have to give their cost. And one thing I would like to take the opportunity to talk about centralizing and decentralizing. You know, I always uh, try to avoid these words, centralized and decentralized. They always come up, even in governance and all that. I would like to use the word distributed and connected. So it is not decentralized, meaning that everyone is separate, separate. It is distributed, but connected. I know there's a trick question. I just want to answer. Thank you for that. You, you've used the correct phrase. I'm thankful to you for that. But uh, there's uh, something one should remember that there are two. Why did I bring this issue of JNU? There's infrastructure which is hard, and there's soft infrastructure. Uh, soft infrastructure. The government can subsidize both. I mean, I don't know where my tax money is really going. You know, if you're going to have a good transmission facility and it is run by a public sector, government owned, as you said, it has to be government owned or a distribution network which is government owned. Don't get into politics there. And if government subsidy goes for that, none of us have any objections. This is the reason why I said public sector educational institution, right from primary school to university education, will be very high. And as Farid Zakaria said, you know, it's a question of ideas, it's a question of energy, hard and soft infrastructure. Uh, you asked me about populist measures and how they impact energy efficiency. In fact, uh, I would say they impact energy efficiency quite negatively because uh, if you look at a, a very simple example of cross subsidy, right, uh, an appliance like a ceiling fan which consumes a lot of power in general, right, and it's, it's used across the classes, uh, different classes of uh, consumers, right. It's used by rural, by below power party line consumers. Uh, less uh, in a house which has an air conditioner, right? So, but because there are cross subsidies, the cost of electricity is quite less for a below party line consumer. And that person will have quite less incentives to shift to an energy efficient ceiling fan just because uh, he'll not probably achieve ROI in the desired time. So, that's it, does impact negativity. Take one more question, please. My question is to Madam and Sir. 
Uh, it is regarding the independence of the regulatory commissions. As you rightly pointed out, uh, it would be best that they are independent. But do you think that there should be a change in the law regarding the appointment of chairman and members of the committee, com uh, commission, which is presently in the hands of the uh, state government? For example, we come from, I come from a uh, union territory and the commission is appointed by the central government. The state government does not have a role in it. And I think it is quite effective in our case. Because as far as Puducherry is concerned, we have filed uh, tariff petitions every year. And uh, this November we are filing for the next uh, financial year also. So now we are disciplined uh, discount. Whether the, uh, in your opinion, the law needs to be changed for the appointment of a chairman and member of the commission because now it is in the hands of the state government and state government can, as it happened in Tamil Nadu, it's a classic example. <laughs> Maybe Mr. Uh, Rao, as you were uh, explaining, uh, chairman of Andhra Pradesh uh, Commission was an exception. <coughs> I think these are, uh, I feel. I mean, you don't have to make an amendment to the act. The act itself gives an option of appointing a retired High Court judge. Um, I I feel that it should be headed by a retired High Court judge, but only for the reason that they have been used to dealing with issues independently. I mean, that's that's the bedrock of the manner in which they have functioned. Don't tell, don't ask me if we appoint a High Court judge, will everything be apple pie? I don't. I'm, I'm not saying that. But these are baby steps. I mean, we need to take uh, each step to the hope that. The law is already there. See, the, uh, the act itself in section, uh, I think, 81 or 82, it says that uh, it is either a high court judge or any other person. And for that, you need to have an independent selection committee. But an independent selection committee, it's again only appointed by the government. So that's where the problem is. So, uh, the, the independence of that independent committee itself then becomes questionable. Because if they are only going to listen to what the government has to say, right? Ultimately, the test is how independent are these people going to be. And we uh, uh, paraded before the Supreme Court, demonstrated before the, the Supreme Court that practically from possibly 2010, every person who has been uh, part of TNERC has been an employee of Tangent Co or Tran Trans Co. So you can't make it a retirement nest. You need to have people who, uh, from outside who have different perspectives, fresh perspectives who look at these issues. But if you are only going to treat it as a retirement nest, it's not going to be fit. There are there are people who are who have been far from tangent who have transfer who, who can be independent. I'm not saying no. But I'm saying that as a general rule, this is what we need to guard against. That there is no compromise on the What I understand is you are saying a retired high court judge should be the chairman. But his question is also who will appoint? <coughs> itself talks about an independent committee, once again uh, headed by a retired High Court judge to make the appointment. The act itself says that. But again, the problem there is it's the uh, state government which fixes that independent committee. So that's why I'm saying that our hope of completely distancing it from politics cannot happen. In a, in a democratic establishment like ours, it is not going to happen. What we can do is try to refine the process through incremental changes and hoping that it will uh, lead to a sea change at some point of time. I just want to give one instance of you. The most remarkable chairman of any electricity regulatory commission has been G.P. Rao. He never interfered, he stood up and, and a fantastic person. He was appointed by uh, Chandrababu Naidu and Chandrababu Naidu believed in political reforms. I met him two years ago in Andhra. He looked at me and said, Madam, because of you I lost the elections. <laughs> I want to respond to a couple of things that um, we've all discussed. Firstly, I completely agree on the issue of regulation. Uh, so this is something that we see across sectors. It's not limited to electricity. You see that uh, the same in uh, urban transport as well. Uh, once the state government is involved and if there is a political act, uh, uh, pressure that's coming in, you are not going to have an independent regulatory body. And I think we have all sort to uh, all 
got to accept that. Secondly, I just wanted to again raise that debate over you know uh, public goods and free provision of uh, pu uh, public goods. I feel that uh, whenever whenever a citizen has to make a trade off uh, and public good is provided uh, you know free of charge he will uh, he or she will make the right choice if you provide free education you are not going to misuse it you are not going to drop out of jnu and go to say uh, kirori maral kirori maral or something of that sort if you are in a drought prone, prone area like 60 percentage of the country is you are not probably going to waste too much of water you know that especially when you know that you are just getting it for a couple of hours if you are getting free public transport you are not going to take more or more than two or three trips you're not going to simply misuse it because you also have a trade-off there in the case of electricity uh, we are seeing some uh, exceptions there but as long as we can ensure that we get the citizen to make a trade-off where we ensure that you know they do not uh, maximize that we should absolutely go for free public goods is my uh, is my uh, thought process and I think it is going to get a bit more uh, popular so this might even extend to free public housing, free transport, free water so I feel that whatever will uh, whatever courts might take up under article uh, 21 uh, under that broadened definition I think that those will be something that all states eventually are going to uh, end up providing uh, of course. Oh, I have uh, this interesting slide which uh, I have made with, with the money which shows that uh, states absolutely make the worst trade-offs. So uh, anyways, because I have got the mic, I will uh, just uh, talk about this. We did this one uh, study of how money was spent in Chennai for urban transport. So we found out that uh, overall, uh, Tamil Nadu government gives 500 crores for uh, as subsidy to various bus corporations, your MTC as well as your other TNSPs, 500 crores. So you can always hear people coming like 500 crores they are getting, this is such a waste of money, who even uses such horrible buses and you hear all of them. Uh, so what I did was, I looked at all the money that was being spent on urban transport in general. So that's thousands of kilometers, uh, that's all your uh, flyovers, your underpasses and so on. Uh, then I sort of looked at how many people travel in what way. People use cars, uh, buses, taxis, uh, two-wheelers, they walk, cycling and so on. So in terms of subsidies, what it turns out is that every time you take a trip in a car, you are getting a subsidy of nearly 90 rupees and if you are taking a trip in a bus you are getting a subsidy of 95 paise so there is that order of magnitude of 100 which is there which is that absolute stupidity that the government is uh, doing uh, making in making the right uh, the wrong choices and that is something that we have as citizens do not really uh, question the government over uh, we are similarly, we are simply not ensuring that money is being spent the right way. We are using it in absolutely the wrong manner, and I am sure that we can come up with the money for that. And uh, well, I am a proponent of the Green New Deal and increased taxation at the top level. So there is definitely sources of money, it's just that we do not have the political will to do that. <laughs>